Hello and welcome to the How to Exit podcast, where we introduce you to a world of small to medium business acquisitions and mergers. We interview business owners, industry leaders, authors, mentors, and other influencers with the sole intent to share with you what it looks like to buy or sell a business. Let's get rolling. And now a moment for our sponsors. I want to highly recommend you get Acquisition Aficionado Magazine. Every month, Acquisition Aficionado Magazine brings you tactics for business buying and selling you won't find anywhere else. Learn firsthand from industry leaders who share their success stories, featuring in-depth interviews and stories from leading figures in the business acquisition industry. This multi-platform mobile magazine speaks to acquisition entrepreneurs wherever they are in the journey. And I want you to visit acquisitionaficionado.com today. Hello and welcome to the How to Exit podcast. Today I'm here with Roland Frazier. Roland is an investor and business strategist with over a thousand acquisitions and exits completed for him and his clients. I'm super excited to be here. Full disclosure, one of my mentors too, man. So to have you on the show is just a real treat for me. Thank you for being here today. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm excited. So, uh, you know, I, I like to joke around and say, hey, you know, you were born, you ended up on my show. Could you fill in the gap? Uh, you know, an mergers and acquisitions show. Uh, Can you fill in the gap in between? Um, how did you get into this space? I know it's just not a like you didn't wake up one day and say, I'm going to go into M&A. Right. So, yeah, it, it was a, a little bit of an evolution. I, I started out when I was 18. I got my real estate salesperson's license and started selling real estate. Um, and the guy, you know, pretty quickly I saw that I didn't really want to go around banging on doors to get onesie twosie listings to sell. And so I was like, well, who's got a whole bunch of listings to sell developers. So started talking to developers, um, uh, ended up getting in with a couple of those guys to be able to sell their listings. So I didn't have to go out looking and then started looking at how they were raising money to do deals. I was like, how do you put this stuff together to where you're doing like, 300 houses or something like that. And they're like, well, we buy the land and do the entitlement and, um, and we go out and get investors and we use these things called limited partnerships. And I was like, okay, well tell me how that works. And they did. And I was like, okay, well, so I, at night when I was 19, I got my insurance license. When I was 20, I got my securities license. So it was like, can I start helping you guys raise money and started doing that through the firm that, um, one of the firms in New York that I hung my securities license with, I got introduced to some people at Prudential Securities. And um, at the time, this is the late 80s, uh, leverage buyouts were super, super hot. And so I got kind of taken under the wing of one of those investment bankers. And they were showing me how you can use the assets of a company to pay for itself. And I was like, that's the coolest thing ever because I was doing real estate deals and no money down and stuff like that. But I didn't know that you could do it with businesses. And so um, I started doing that. And um, kind of never stopped because I just like along the way, I was like, well, I could probably take a lot of the stuff I learned about real estate and apply to acquisitions as well. And then um, started looking at, well, okay, well, it's nice to own companies, but it's also nice to exit because when you exit, you get paid several years of profit all in one go. So if I can buy enough companies that I can exit several of them a year, every year I could have 30, 40, 50 years of income. And that sounds pretty exciting. And so I just kind of followed the path to doing that along the way. I got my accounting degree. I got my law degree, practiced law for several years. But all along, I've been really, really just kind of an entrepreneur at heart. I get it. You know, we both have uh, similar backgrounds, not not to the same scale. I actually uh, I was a marketing coach and one of my clients was a real estate investor. So he pretty much bought our firm and told me to come under his wing and, you know, integrate me in and I helped him grow it. And, uh, you know, then I kind of burned out on it a little bit and I hired a performance coach to see what was next. And he said something to me in one of those calls. He said, uh, you know, with everything you know and all the skills you have and as smart as you are, you should be playing a bigger game. I don't care how big of a flip we did. We get one of our better flips is 40 K, right? That's a, that's a good profit for a single family house in Tulsa. Hey, Oklahoma. Every 40 K helps. <laughs> and they would wire that money into the account before I think it was 42 K. And in the back of my head, I'd hear his voice, but you should be playing a bigger game. <laughs> <laughs> so I went out and hunted down one. And I, you know, I, 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 I bought a small company and I bought it wrong. Uh, it was way too small. Uh, and, uh, I bought pretty much just bought the equipment and a customer list, which didn't pound out that much. And I thought, well, I don't know what I'm doing here. So I went and hired some of you guys to show me like what, you know, 
and uh, did your epic course and some other stuff. So I'm excited to be here with you today. Let's talk Great. about the opportunity a little bit. A lot of people don't understand how vast this opportunity, especially in our point in time in history. Yeah, it, it's um, it, it's kind of shocking. There, there are several things that are kind of conspiring to make it a great opportunity. To, to me, the three most important ones are that you've got 12 million baby boomers that are kind of aging out at this point, a lot of them in their businesses, and some of them will go forever, but, but it's about 12 million total that own about $10 trillion worth of businesses. And so over the next 10 years, we can expect thousands and thousands and thousands of deals to become available. The, the, the other thing that impacts this is that a lot of those people, when they decide they want to sell, they find they, they haven't built a sellable business. So they don't ever get to the point where they can sell it because they start talking to people and they're like, well, you're an owner operator. And if you leave, the business is gone. You don't really have a business. You have a job. And so it's going to be awful hard to sell that. Now they could professionalize and bring management in, but a lot of them don't want to do that or don't know how. And so a lot of those people, about 600,000 a year, just close the doors to the business. And then the other thing is, is that only about 20% of the people that decide to list their business for sale actually get a sale as a result of listing the business. And so between the closure, the closings and the failures, the, uh, number of people who are kind of clamoring now to sell their businesses who, by the way, their kids want to be Instagram stars. They don't want, they want to be influencers. They don't want to be a car wash owner, or parking lot owner, laundromat owner, right? Uh, that that's not terribly exciting compared to taking your picture in a, you know, private airplane seat that you rent for 15 minutes. And, um, my the, six year old just uh, said she wants a YouTube market, channel. <laughs> yeah. Right. And then that market inefficiency like that, that, that it doesn't have the capacity to handle, there isn't a good, it's very fractured, the market for selling businesses. And so until you get up into investment banking, um, it's just interesting how far behind that is compared to something like real estate. You know, there's a lot of, uh, like a lot of these guys, they get into it. They, I, I call them accidental entrepreneurs. They didn't actually set out to start a business. They, they produced a widget a friend wanted, so they sold them one. And the next thing I know, somebody's seeing that and they wanted one too. You know, or in the case of like a heat and air company, you're working for somebody, you know, else. And then one day you just get sick of it and think you can do it better. Yep. But they didn't. They, they just don't have the training, schooling, whatever you want to call it, to do the level of business and books and financial, you know, documents that the P&E guys expect to see. Right. The profit and loss statements and stuff like that. So a lot of these small guys, you get into it and, uh, you know. They're not only owner operators, there's a kind of a mess there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the buyer pool, I, I was, I had one of your, you know, actually one of your guys on here that kind of corrected me in this space when I told him, it's like, yeah, I've looked at so many business and just sh shushed them off because their books are a mess. And he said, why? If the business is good, they make a great product and it's profitable and you can make sense of the books. Why shush them off? Yep. Just because they don't know how to do accounting. Yep. And he said, are you an accountant? I'm like, no, I have to hire those guys too. But if I can't make sense of it, he goes, bring them into the evaluation, help them make sense of it, you know, in the early stage. Yeah. Right. Well, let's just let's look at the um, the space here. Right. So there's a many ways to get into that. You teach a lot of different aspects of that. One of the things that I like is this contract for equity or this, you know, consulting for equity. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of guys out there. They do consulting. A lot of these small businesses, the only way they're going to get to an exit is through some type of professional services to help them you know, become exitable. Yep. So what does that look like? What, you know, what, what does that entail? I uh, kind of a, what, what does, which part entail? The contract for equity or working for equity or getting a piece of a business by something you do as a profession anyway. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it look, you've got value to invest through cash or through services, experience, skills, and connections that you've got. And so a lot of businesses, that are looking to accomplish something that they haven't been able to accomplish yet are willing to have somebody come in and do the things that they need in exchange for giving them a piece of the company. So if you're thinking, you know, like as a consultant, you're building the brands of other people's companies and you can add millions or tens of millions of dollars in value by the services that you bring and the efforts that you exert and you're getting a pittance for doing that. So I think it's it, we've seen a trend lately in entertainment where celebrities 
are saying, I'm not going to just be a spokesperson for a brand anymore. I'm going to own the underlying brand because I can then build wealth and equity. And I'm not just constantly pimping myself out in exchange for a payment to build somebody else's brand. And so the same thing is true with consulting is I think that we all with value to bring to businesses that can impact the wealth or the, the transferable value of that business so significantly are kind of crazy to just provide those services for some flat fee, even if it's a good flat fee, maybe it's a 50,000 or 500,000 or a million dollars. But if you're going to add tens of millions, then why would you accept some small fee? So like kind of on the scale of consulting, you got the hamster wheel of trading dollars for hours. And then when you stop, you know, you're a dancing bear, right? Whenever you stop, the music stops, the dancing stops, the crowd stops throwing money. But a smart consultant can, instead of doing that, get a higher effective rate. You can start and you can go and say, oh, well, I'm going to do a flat fee because this is something I do over and over and over. So I effectively increase my hourly rate for something that I know how to do and have done a lot and have templates for. Uh, from say $200 an hour to $2,000 an hour, but you're still a dancing bear. So then the next would be rev share and rev share is good, but that's typically a limited period of time on a limited thing. So I'm going to help you do, uh, create this marketing campaign. And so as long as this marketing campaign runs, we're going to share revenue and I'm going to get 10% royalty or something like that. That's nice. But again, um, you're not getting any wealth that's built. So then we get to kind of that higher level, which is consulting for equity, where you say, I'm going to deliver the value. And in exchange for that, once I we agree on the value that I'm going to deliver in the period of time that I'm going to do it over, then when I do that, I am going to own X percent of the company. That is a way to have income and wealth. Income from the distributions that you get of profits and wealth from what you're going to have when the company finally sells. So I think like that's that's the concept is, is stop being a dancing bear, stop trading dollars for hours, get yourself compensated, commensurate with the value that you bring to all these different companies. And, and it ends up being a huge win win because, you know, at some point, most of these consultants are going to do something else, right? They, you can only be the dancing bear for so long before you realize you're a dancing bear. Yeah. Um, and, and you even look at, there are professions where, you know, doctors and, and chiropractors and stuff like that their their whole life they're a dancing bear they're an, yep. they're an operator most people and yeah and until they until it clicks in their head that they don't have to be right there's a um, there's a transforming of, effect of a human being when he realizes he doesn't have to do what he's always done yep so so what are the other op you know, opportunities that there's we've already talked about like you know consulting get a piece of it um if you're a lot of these guys that are listening to the show. They don't have millions of dollars laying around and some of them don't have the credit worthiness to, you know, get an SBA loan and, or, or have the assets to back it. I see you talk a lot about like getting into these deals really creative. Could you talk about a little bit like kind of what that looks like and, and what, what it means to, you know, what are the different ways we can get into owning a business of our own without having to be an 800 credit score and a million dollars in the bank? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, um, the, to me, like, like the, what we talked about is a good place to start. Like kind of if, if I'm looking at a deal and I can come in and provide value and in exchange for that, I can get a piece of the company. That's exciting for me because the company is already existing. It's already making profits. It already has all its operations and operators. And, um, then I'm going to do the thing I do. And that company doesn't need me to be there on a day-to-day -day basis to, continue to operate. So I think like the first level is, can I provide this company some capital in the form of the knowledge, spills, ex knowledge skills, experience, and connections I've got in exchange for an equity interest? Then if I can do that, no money out of pocket, I have a piece of the deal, I do my thing, and then I get paid. Um, on the other hand, if that doesn't seem to be an option and you're thinking, well, I'd actually like to just acquire a company to own the whole company. And, um, that's possible too. And you can go the traditional route, which would be you pay some level of cash for that, which is typically a combination of cash you've got and saved and loans, uh, which require credit. Or you can go kind of the alternative way, which is my favorite thing to do, which is to say, what are the ways to let the business pay for itself? So this all harkens back to the days with um, the guys in New York looking at their leverage buyouts saying, you know, they're buying billion, multi-billion dollar companies 
without any money. That's pretty crazy. How are they doing that? Well, a lot of it is debt. That's the leverage part of leverage buyout. But, um, but that debt is leveraged against the assets of the company. So you go and look at the company and say, I like to start out and say, okay, how much do you want Mr. or Ms. Seller? I, you know, I want $5 million. Great. So 5 million is here. I've got zero that I want to put in right now. So I've got a $5 million gap to fill. So then it's a question of, well, what are the things that I can do to bridge the gap between zero and 5 million? And so I'll start talking to them. And some of the easier ones would be the best debt is typically seller financing because it comes with the least restrictions and it's the most favorable. So then the first question I'm going to have is, would you be willing to finance any of that? And, um, and I'll like in an ideal world, I'd like for them to finance a whole thing. Um, I'll generally start at a combination of, uh, of, uh, finance and earn out and the finance portion, whatever amount, like, let's say that it's 5 million is my gap. And they say, I'll finance 20%. Great. Okay, cool. Well, that's a million of gap fill. And so I call that the deal stack, right? Stacking kind of all the different ways we can fund this. So let's say we get 20% through seller finance. And then I'll say, well, would you consider doing an earnout? Because an earnout says, you know, hey, we can't completely agree on what the price is right now, but I'll pay you the price that you're asking for as long as certain events happen, like people stay, clients stay, profit levels are hit, income sales levels are hit, lots of things you can peg it to. Uh, and, and they typically run between 10 and 40% of the company for between one and four years. So maybe I can get an earnout that says, I'll give you um, 5% per year of the purchase price you're asking over four years. And that's now another million dollars, that's 20%, right? That I don't have to worry about. So I've got my gap closed. Now I only owe 6 million towards, I mean, well, it was, uh, what was a 5 million purchase. Now I only owe 3 million. Uh, I'm only 3 million short. So then you start looking at other things. And one of the easiest places to find value would be in the assets that the company has. If they've got inventory, equipment, real estate, anything of value, then there are asset-based lenders that I can go and get funding on. So maybe I could get another 20% that way. And then I could, then I can get into some more complicated things like, well, maybe they've got accounts receivables and we can factor. And so we go to these people called factors and they'll either buy or lend against the accounts receivable. And maybe that's another 20%. Now I'm 4 million of my 5 million there. And then I might find the last place. Um, maybe there's a, um, uh, like a revenue-based financing loan that I can go and get. Revenue-based financing is pretty easy to put in place these days. So I'll go to a lender like American Express or Lighter or one of those guys and say, you know, hey, can you give me a million dollars against the income of the company? Yeah, it's been doing that for, you know, six years or whatever. Yeah, we're, we're happy to do that. And now I've completed my deal stack and I have the thing acquired and I haven't had to come out of pocket. That's kind of the, the idea behind that. You know, one of the interesting things I learned in, in the course and uh, I had a, we actually had a concrete plant we were looking at, and unfortunately, the IRS stopped the transfer because they owed the IRS nine hundred and sixty thousand dollars. But uh, and they were in some type of receivership. They actually had to go to a quarterly meetings with them and show them the plan on how they were going to stay on track. Yeah. And in that meeting, they told the IRS like, "We're going to sell this guys, and these guys are going to take over the debt." And the IRS like, "No, you're not." <laughs> so, <laughs> but before that happened, you mentioned something. They were to the point where before we knew they had some how much trouble they had. They wanted a few hundred thousand dollars down for a thirteen million dollar. Uh, concrete, twelve and a half million dollar concrete uh, manufacturing. They they poured concrete uh, storm shelters and stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know we were looking at that and we come out of pocket. But we found an operator that had grown a business from ten to like a hundred plus million. He retired out of that and wanted to buy his own company. So we sold him the CEO operator role on the on the precept that you know he he could come in here you know and put his money to this, own a piece of it be the operator and gain more money over time. So we were going to be able to get into that. At, you know, like, it was, a, it was a dollar down deal. And nice. uh, like I said, when they went, we, they had said yes at the table and they went back to, to review everything. And, and uh, dad still had a place as 60 something year old company. Dad still had a play in this. They were going to tell him what they were doing. And uh, then they went to their IRS meeting and told the IRS and the IRS said no. So we got put on hold, but it, you know, in theory, it worked. They, you know, we were going to get into that for no money out of our pocket, right? And I didn't want to be the operator anyway. I was trying not to buy another job. So yeah, exactly. Man. But uh, so there's just this vast thing, of, you know, this this huge uh, opportunity in front of us. We're talking about millions of businesses out there that you know have to change hands at some point. 
what do you think the economy is going to do to to this? Like I call, I refer to all of us that are in this space as acquisition entrepreneurs. I know I didn't come up with it, but that's kind of the name that's been given to us, right? Mm -hmm. So for the acquisition entrepreneur, do you think that the looming recession, bad economy, whatever helps us or hurts us? I think change always creates opportunity. So I I think that I would way rather see a recession coming than a continuing bull market that goes on 20 years. Uh, because within that comes great opportunity. We just have to be astute to recognize what the opportunity is. So as the economy trends towards recession and uh, the Fed just said today, you know, hey, we're not, we're not uh, going to ease up on interest rate increases. And, um, and we've got two quarters of reduced or falling GDP. Um, but we've got contrary signs too. We've got a stock market that the S and P is up over 50% from its lowest peak to its highest peak year over year. So the two quarters of GDP contraction indicates recession. The two quarters or the one year with 50% up in S and P indicates bull market. Who knows what's going to happen, right? Well, what we do know is that interest rates are going to go up for a little bit. They're certainly higher than they've been. That means debt is more expensive. That means that the people who are trying to sell businesses that are small are going to have a harder time selling those businesses than they were in the past if debt is being used to acquire them. We don't really use uh, commercial debt. And so we can kind of set the interest rates we want. Now, you might argue, well, the expectation of sellers would be to receive a higher percentage interest rate, but that also isn't the case because the um, the seller wants to sell the business, right? So as long as you find somebody that wants to sell the business, and we're always looking, by the way, for motivated sellers. We're not looking for somebody that's like, well, I don't want to sell, but you know, if somebody pays me stupid money, I'll sell. That's not who we want. Um, and so knowing that that there's going to be some difficult times ahead for businesses a lot of people, and we know the whole, those stats we talked about at the beginning of the show about baby boomers, we know that there's going to be increased motivation for people to sell and decreased opportunity for them to sell, which creates for us as acquirers, great opportunity. Now on the high side of the market, when we get past these sub 10 million, sub 2 million, pro, sub, sub 10 million sales, sub 2 million in EBITDA or profit companies, um, then there are giant opportunities because there's still crazy amounts of dry powder sitting about $5 trillion with private equity and SPACs and family offices and high net worth individuals and strategic buyers. And there's an increasing number of funds. So that means that there's even more competition among them for the few deals that meet their criteria. So I think that the, the two most giant opportunities are if you can get in the niche of helping owner operated businesses professionalize so that they're no longer owner operated, then you're generally going to receive around a two to three X increase in the value of the company because there will be far more buyers for a professionally managed company than there will be for an owner operated company. Owner operated company means somebody has got to come in and either professionalize it, which is a pain in the butt or they've got to have a job as the operator. And so when we get past that, that like that arbitrage there to me is giant. And then the second arbitrage is as we grow those companies up from smaller sales, from SMBs to larger businesses, that presents a tremendous opportunity because the delta between the average across all industries valuation as of last quarter for a professionally managed business was only a 4.5 X, but the average private equity deal was a 15.2. So there's still that giant gap there. And unless things change dramatically with the S and P it over the last couple of months has gone from about a 21 PE average across all the, um, uh, I'm sorry, across all the NASDAQ companies to a 28. So there's still plenty of upside for the private equity companies to continue to pay high multiples because they're going to pick up almost a 10 X multiple going public or selling to a public company. So everybody can still win except the owner operated business that never has had a really good chance of winning. Right? So we have a sophisticated evolved market 
for selling companies to the public. They're called the stock exchanges, right? And we have the, a sophisticated market of investment bankers, private equity funds, strategic planners, family offices, SPACs, et cetera, that are buyers there playing that let's flip from an acquisition at a 15 to a sale at a 28. And then we have us. And for, to me, where we sit is, is right in the middle of let's help those owner operated businesses get big enough and get professionalized so that they can appeal to the private equity people that are willing to pay the 15s. And I'll pay, you know, two to five X all day long to sell for 15 a couple of years later. You know, one of the strategies, I don't know if I picked it up from you or somebody else that we used on that one I was talking about was we didn't offer to buy 100% of the company. We offered to buy 70, I think, 70 or 75. And then yep. we showed them a plan that that 30% would be worth more than the 70 after we're done with it. Because we were we were at that stage where they were doing 10, 10 to 12. On a, on a, they, they varied. It was like 10 one year, 12 one year, 12 and a half another year in revenue. But they spent every penny they made. They were trying to minimize taxes like that. One of the years they were doing the, that, they had like a thirteen or fifteen thousand dollar profit. Yeah, it was just insane what they were doing. So, <clears throat> you know, well, we just showed them like, look, let us do this. Let us. Here's our plan for the next three to four years. We've got four more of these we were already looking at. We're gonna, you know, there's a there's a problem in that is is they're expensive to transport. So it's actually cool to own you know those concrete manufacturing that make the same product line in certain regions. So you don't have to if you have to drive them more than hundred miles, you're spending a lot of money. They had. 35 trucks with specially made trucks to lift these things up on there and to haul them. And their business expense was their insurance. They actually, they had killed somebody the year before in an auto accident because one of those things had come off. And uh, one of the reasons they were selling, she was a nurse before she took over daddy's business. And the fact that her company took the life of a, you know, two people was two people in the car just kept eating at her. So there's, there's all these different reasons, but, um, as far as like that zero down, no, no down thing, it's just part of it showing them like, here's the plan we're going to do with this. And if I leave you with 30% of it, that could very really well be a, a, a check way bigger than you were expecting to get right now. Yeah. So, and that's a, that's a very old strategy that um, private equity has used for years is that, you know, they, they and, and think about it, like they don't really want to operate the company. And so one of the biggest risks in acquiring is the operator risk. So if they were to acquire hundred percent of a company, and then the owner was to leave, then they've got to find an operator. And we don't know if that operator will be as successful as the current group at running the company. So one of the best things that they can do is they can say, let's come in and they'll typically buy 70 to 90%, leaving 10 to 30% with existing management. And existing management then has a second bite at the apple. That's literally what they call it, right? We give you a second bite at the apple. We're going to play, plan on taking this thing public or selling it at a 6X more than we bought it for. How'd you like to effectively probably get more on the small percentage that you retained than on the first, uh, first percentage that you sold, right? And then what they get for that is then those people have skin in the game still. They've still got 10, 20, 30%. They've still got the con continuity of management. So there's no disruption there. There's no risk to new management and then everybody wins as the company goes along that's the that's the theory it doesn't always work out that way but that's that's the theory so yeah, partial had, buys great great strategy i had a uh, adam on here adam uh coffee you know you you're familiar with him so uh -huh. uh, yeah he he uh, he has a couple of books out and stuff but uh they did a heat and air company that sold it to private equity i think five different times where he stayed as the ceo through all five the last yeah. exit was over a billion dollars so yeah. it was it was significant but you think you took five paychecks you know pay, five paydays along the way and uh, but so it's a you know pick that up and like apply it down to our level it's one of the things i like doing is like what are the other guys doing and how can i apply that to, to something that works for me exactly so, so let's talk about you know how do you get started in something like this what what's the i mean I, a lot of people spend years searching for their first deal and that type of stuff. Um, where do you suggest people um, like kind of get their t their teeth cut or what do you want to call it? What am I breaking breaking in into into this space and and try to figure this out? It's it's a great question. I think something that a lot of people struggle with, but the there's really a few ways to do it. The one way is if you have people who are asking you consistently. Like if you look back over the last 90 days and say, did anybody ask, can I pick your brain? Did anybody say, you know, can I take you to coffee? Can you help me with this problem? Could I give you equity in my company? 
Can you uh, give me some advice on my business? Any of those things, those are all great clues that people value the knowledge, skills, experience, connections that you've got. And um, most of us either just say no and uh, and and because they don't want to be bothered or we say sure and we go and have the two hour lunch and they ask us all the questions and then they don't do anything with the great advice that we gave them so what what i found to be something that works really well is instead of being frustrated at all the people that are asking for advice and then you give your time and then most of them don't take it uh you can say look the way I do that is with a consultation. And to me, it's the way I do that is with a half day consult. Uh, we'll take a look at the problems that you've got and the challenges you're facing, the constraints you're experiencing, and we'll break through them and get you from where you are right now to where you want to go. The investment, not the cost, but the investment to do that is $25,000. That's what I've chosen to do. Other people could do any different amount. Um, and we'll spend uh, up to four hours going down and breaking through that. If that's something that sounds like a fit, let me know and I'll, I'll give you my one-page consulting agreement and wiring instructions. And if not, no harm, no worries, uh, no foul. But I only have time to work with my paying consulting clients and my portfolio companies. So saying that, like having that kind of down pat is really helpful because A, it screens out all the people that aren't willing to invest in themselves and B, it converts all those things that you're throwing off right now that are potential deal flow into deal flow. And so, um, and, and the other nice thing is, is that by putting up a filter of some fee for your initial working with them, you not only weed out the people that won't invest in themselves, but also you can pick up a decent side hustle income. So, you know, for me, I started doing that and it changed everything because all the people that were taking up so much of my time and stopping me from hitting the goals that I had for myself went away. They instantly fell away. It now repulses the people who are exactly who I don't want to deal with. And it only attracts the people that I do. So that's the first thing is that you probably have deal flow right now if you've got anybody asking for any kind of advice from you. And then the second threshold would be, okay, maybe you don't have anybody that's asking that uh, right now. Um, I'd say, well, you need to get out more. But um, but uh, if you don't have that, then you can say, okay, well, where, where can I find businesses? And so if you've got an existing business, I built a thing called an acquisition wheel. And I say, if you can ask the question, what do I want to solve for in my current existing business? And uh, you answer that question, then that'll tell you what you should acquire. So I think having an idea of what, what is it that I want to acquire what is my acquisition criteria is really critical. If you don't have acquisition criteria, then you're going to maybe buy anything and you could definitely buy the wrong thing. So those questions would be, what am I solving for in my current business? Do I want more customers? If I do, then I'm going to horizontally integrate. I'm going to acquire competitors, whether they're indirect or direct. Maybe I want more leads. Then I'm going to acquire media, people that have already aggregated the attention and eyeballs of my ideal customer profile. Maybe I need infrastructure or teams or other resources like that. Then I'm going to aqua hire. I'm going to look for people that already have the teams that I want. I'm going to acquire them, merge them with my company. Now I've instantly got a sales team, a software dev team, an engineering team, an R&D team, etc. Uh, maybe I say, well, gosh, I really would just want more sales, I, and I'd like to ideally have an av a higher average order value than I'm getting right now. Then you're going to look for other companies that have products or services that your existing customer base is already buying before, during, or after the time they're buying from you. Or maybe you say, I would actually like a higher lifetime customer value. Well, then you're going to look to acquire companies or products or services that have recurring components, or you want more profit, then I'm going to go vertically integrate up and down the supply and distribution chain, or I need innovation, then you're going to acquire IP, right? So those are seven categories of acquisitions that really cover pretty much any challenge that you might be experiencing in your business that you've got right now. So let's say that I identified that I want more leads, so I'm going to go after media. Then I'm going to say, okay, who can I identify? I'm going to make a long list of all the people that have aggregated the attention and eyeballs of my ideal customer profile. That might be in groups on Facebook or LinkedIn. It might be newsletters, magazines, publications, trade shows, um, events. 
It could be uh, television shows. It could be podcasts. You know, there's all these things that hundreds or thousands or hundreds of thousands or even millions of my ideal customer have already been gathered up and they're all in one place. And there's a trust agent that they look to. And if I can make a deal with that trust agent to acquire that media, now I own that. I've got all the leads I ever need. And so I think that like for a business owner, that's the place to start. And then if you don't have a business, it's okay. Um, how can I take an inventory of the, the things that, that I'm interested in and the knowledge and skills and experience and connections I've got so that I can identify a place to start. And so with that, I say, I do a quadrant kind of analysis and I say, you know, who, what are your hobbies, passions, and interests, right? What's my hobbies, passions, and interests? What are the things that I actually like to do? And just brainstorm those out. And then you say, what do I have actual experience in and skills? And then you say, what are my superpowers? What am I like really good at? And last but not least, what connections do I have that might be helpful in this journey? And when you do those four things and then kind of cross out the things that are the hobbies and interests and passions that you probably wouldn't want to do for business or you don't think would be good fit, and you, you really drill down to your top, say, three top skills and experience and your top three connection networks and your top three superpowers, that's going to become self-evident what you should do. And so, um, so then you take that and run it through a income analysis and say, okay, now I know the industry. I know what I'm going to do. I know who I'm going to help. I know kind of how I'm going to help them. Um, what do I need to make? And what I need to make is going to determine the size of the EBITDA or the profit of the business that you're going to acquire. Cause you can say, Oh, I want to make $10,000 a month doing this. Great. So I know I need an EBITDA uh, or an SDE, a seller discretionary earnings of at least 10,000 times 12 months, 120 grand to do that. But I probably also want to put some money into growing the business. How much do I want to put in growing the business? Let's say that's another 10 grand a month. Well, now you've got 120 you want to get paid and you got 120 you've got to invest. That's 240,000. Any business that's not making 240,000 or more in profit gets put off the list, right? And so it's kind of reverse engineering that way into that. Now, once you identify all of those acquisition criteria, you say, okay, where am I going to find these things? Two different real approaches. One is organic, and that's where you're going to tell everybody what you do. That's friends, family, employees, uh, you know, contractors, everybody that you work with. Um, the next would be that you go to centers of influence that would have the people that you want, like attorneys, accountants, uh, valuation experts, investment bankers, business brokers, those kinds of people. And then there's the systematic way where you say, I'm going to go to Sales Navigator, Zoom Info, or Crunchbase. I'm going to build a list of at least a thousand potential acquisitions that fit my acquisition criteria. And now I'm going to do an outbound marketing campaign for those people. That might be a combination of email, direct messages, and um, uh, snail mail, direct mail. And then I'm going to use mail houses and automated ringless voicemail and CRMs to do those campaigns so that they can be tagged and you know followed up with. Uh, then I'm going to say, okay, what systems do I need to build to receive the calls as they come in? I'll probably get a call center to do that. Um, the call center is going to basically have a VA uh, that's going to vet, go through my acquisition criteria to be sure that these people who are calling in do in fact meet them. And then the few that do, they'll set appointments for me to have a conversation with them. And um, if I do those things, then there's just really an endless amount of deal flow that I'm going to have. I can just vision it right now. Most people are going to rewind this and listen to that three times. You just dumped this is amazing amount of knowledge in a short period of time. So uh, I appreciate that. Uh, yeah. And that's just the fire hose you get for being around you. I, I've been I've been on seminars with you. I've been in courses with you. And it's just like, okay, I can't write this fast. I'm going to watch that again. So I absolutely <laughs> love it. What's the story time? I always like some good stories and stuff. What's one of the coolest things you've ever helped either by yourself, you know, buy a piece of for yourself or, or one of your, one of your clients, one of your students. You know, there, there's so many deals in there to me. They're just all fascinating. So I, I like the, uh, I think that like the, 
kind of the big game changers are fun. Um, I remember sitting in, um, sitting down at a restaurant with uh, the owner of a publishing company and um, we were talking about acquiring and I had just experienced some pretty significant losses. So I didn't have a ton of cash handy, but this deal was really good. And I'd been working on it for a couple of years and um, they sat down and they had just had uh, some challenges with some key personnel that were leaving and it opened up an opportunity to invest in the company. Um, and when we had first talked, we were talking about a valuation of around $10 million, but because they needed some cash to fix the things that were going wrong, um, they wanted a million dollars. And so there was the opportunity to acquire 33% of the company for a million dollars. So that's a 70% discount in the valuation, right? Going from 10 million to, uh, to 3 million as a valuation. So I sat there and, and, uh, you know, we, we had uh, breakfast and then, you know, they said, so, you know, if you, if you're interested, let's do this and we'll do it for a million dollars. And I was like, absolutely. Sounds great. Now I didn't have a million dollars, nor did I know where I was going to get the million dollars, but that didn't stop me. I just to say yes, and I'll make it happen, which I would highly recommend for anybody. And, um, and then we were able to talk about that. And I said, well, you, you guys need that all at once. And he's like, no, I don't think we need it all at once. I said, well, how about uh, if we did, and we went back and forth and we ended up with, um, I'll, I'll get $400,000 down and then they'll do $200,000 a year for three years, no interest, just $200,000 a year. But I also was able to negotiate that, like, well, not negotiate, but I also knew that the profits that would be coming to me from the business would be about $360,000 a year. So I knew that I could even after taxes pay that 200 K. So all I had to do was come up with the 400. Um, and I knew that if I could get a deal on the 400 that would allow me to pay that back over time, then it was likely that the business was going to make even more as time went on. But even if it didn't, I'd still have, now this would be pre-tax, but I'd still have 360,000 minus 200,000 over those three years would mean I'd have 160,000 extra, right? So that would mean that I would have 480,000, which would give me enough to pay off the 400 and then still have 80 left over. Again, taxes notwithstanding. But I would work out, I mean, I'd probably go in hock to the IRS for a <laughs> deal like that and pay the interest and get a payment plan worked out if I had to. Turns out I didn't. What I did was then I went and I talked to a friend of mine that was uh, looking to make more on their money than they were making. And um, we cut a deal where they advanced uh, $400,000 to me. Uh, and it was on a, uh, on a three-year loan and with a three-year balloon at 10% interest. So basically it worked great for them because they were making... 40, uh, excuse me, 40, yeah, 40 grand a year in interest on the 400. And, um, I would pay them back from the money that was coming. And that, that deal, uh, I, that deal was a hundred X return for me on, on the, you know, even on the mount, it was, it's infinite obviously, cause there's no money out of my pocket, but it was a uh, hundred X just on the value of the acquisition over time. So pretty, pretty cool thing that happened there. And those deals, like there's just so many of those, but I look back at them and I'm just like, you know, and I'll tell my wife, I'll come home and I'll say, remember that time? It, like we'll be, let's say in Mexico. Uh, and, and I'll just have had a deal and put something together. And I say, remember that time we were in Mexico and we did that deal that, uh, you know, that turned into a hundred million dollars. And she's like, yeah, that, I, that seems like it happens a lot. I'm like, yeah, it does. But it's really cool because the, you can mark your deal history you know, your personal deal history with those key deals like that, that, that just, you know, and the more you're out there, the more you put yourself out there, the more they come around. So that would be one of them. That's cool. So one of the things that I caught in that whole concept is you equated that as if the business was going to stay flat and you would never, in, I know, I know you know it well enough now to know you would never enter anything that you couldn't impact, right. Or you couldn't see an upward side to it. So you did the math and you did the like, okay, I'm, I'm risking working for this company for three or four years and, you know, paying them off. But you wouldn't be there if you didn't think you could make an impact. You didn't want to be there. You wouldn't be there if you didn't think you could make the company make more money than it's making now or, you know, fix something wrong to drive the revenue up. So, but yeah. you didn't do that coulda, woulda, shoulda. I'm going to factor, because a lot of people do that. They, when they're thinking about a deal, 
like it's a little expensive, but if I do X, Y, and Z, I get my money back and I make some money. You did the math as, okay, it's going to run the way it's going to run. And does it pay for itself? And if yes, then it makes pretty good sense because I'm not going to get there and do nothing. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But, but I didn't, I, you know, I wouldn't want to take the chance with anybody's money that, that it wasn't going to work out. I mean, I, I would have made that deal work, whatever it took. And right. uh, I think that's the bottom line that everybody like when you see a fantastic deal like that, you've got to jump on it. You've got to say absolutely. And then hustle like crazy to make it work because like it won't last like th- that kind of deal isn't going to sit around. If they'd have gone to anybody else, they'd have had that money in a heartbeat. Right. You often say that one once in a lifetime deals come along. How often? Three, three or four times a year. Once a lifetime deal comes around three or four times a year. You know, Unlike the, the guy with the leaf blower behind me, who apparently is going to sit at my window and blow the leaves the entire time. <laughs> He's coming around 100% of the time. <laughs> I don't hear it at all, so maybe it's not picking up on the mic. Or, good. That good, doesn't good, say good. much. I'm I'm deaf and have hearing aids underneath this, so uh, <laughs> it might be like really loud and everybody else is obnoxiously annoyed, uh, annoyed by it, and I'm like, oh, that sounds fine. I think so, there's, just, there's a group of people that have all of our houses watched, and they're like, yeah. if they see that you're walking towards your computer to do a podcast or something, they're like, get the leaf blowers out. <laughs> anyway so uh yeah let's just jump back into this so we had a cool story like is there any industry that you just would totally avoid right now like is there anything like i just wouldn't touch that with a 10-foot pole i mean for me there are a lot of them so i i just like i don't want litigation prone or regulatory prone businesses so i i'll stay away from a lot of really favorable opportunities just because i i don't want the exposure. So, you know, anything that's governed by FINRA or HIPAA or, you know, uh, heavy FTC risk or FCC risk or FDA risk, you know, those, uh, it's just so much extra hassle. Uh, and also industries that have uh, high CapEx that quickly obsolesces like an AV company. So they need a lot of capital expenditures um, to acquire all of the equipment. And then the equipment is outdated pretty much six months after they bought it. And if they're going to stay in the game, they've got to keep upgrading. Um, I also don't like inventory heavy businesses because if I can get a business that's a service business, then I completely eliminate my cogs, right? It's, uh, you know, my cogs category of my cost of goods sold category of the inventory I've got to buy. How am I going to fund that? How am I going to warehouse it? How am I going to finance it? You know, who's going to handle it? Who's going to 3PL it? All of that kind of stuff is a non-issue in a services company. So so for me, those are kind of part of the acquisition criteria that that goes into what, how do I identify what I am looking for is to know what I'm not looking for. So I think it's a great question. It's good for people to know, what do you not want? Because then you can immediately say, that's not for me and go deeper, faster into what you do want. Yeah, I like that. So interesting that stuff in a box doesn't appeal to me much. We had one company we were trying to launch and we literally named it SIB. And uh, to, excuse my French, but it was shit in a box, right? Yeah. So we were selling stuff on Shopify. We had li- lined up the products we were going to sell and we just called it uh, SIB Productions or Products or something like that, LLC. When mm-hmm. Shopify figured out what SIB stand for, they banned us for life from it. They just said no. Nah. And it's because, you know, I, I joked, you know, I joked with the uh, business partner and that because he was on the phone when they did it. And it's like, they're really like self-conscious about all the junk that people sell on there, right? They don't, they didn't want us to, you know, SIB, like shit in a box, right? <laughs> and that's just the, you know, stuff in a box, what do you call it? And that was my nickname I used for anything where I had to house with inventory, put it in a box and ship it to somebody. Yep. And I called them, you know, SIB businesses. Yep. And uh, to be nice, stuff in a box. But yep. uh, that's funny is the Shopify, uh, they asked the business partner, what does SIB stand for? And he said, shit in a box. And they're like, no. And they basically, I mean, they, they rejected his credit card. They didn't strike, like shut down the store. We, we were still setting it up and working with them. But uh, they said, don't ever come back. <laughs> right. So, yeah. But uh, I, I'm a big fan of like, knowing what you want and the fast, like, I like what you said. The fastest way to know what you want is clear, clear description of what you don't want. Right. Yeah. I, uh, I got into owning a pest control company in Tulsa, Oklahoma, because I had some relatives working there. They talked me into it. I buy it. Next thing I know, I'm having to take all the tests and get licenses because they have to hang on somebody. And the guy that we bought it from or we're trying to buy it from, one, wasn't following the rules. And two, wanted to retire and we didn't want the liability. So we ended up just getting the used equipment and some customers. So 
that's where reason I came out to you guys to learn more was I bought that one totally wrong, like too small, all these other problems. And then I moved here to California. I live in Northern California in wine country now. And they'd be like, Hey, you're going to, you're going to make a branch of lullaby pest control in, 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 in Northern California. It's like, hell no. And they're like, why? I said, because the same rules apply. The EPA rules and regulations apply, except for California, it applies some really mean teeth to them. So if you'd accidentally spill something in Oklahoma, they say, shame on you. You got to clean it up and stuff. Here, you could face tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars of fines overnight. Yeah. You know, for a blue collar action. You know, the guys you hire to go out and do this, they're not rocket scientists, right? Yeah. They're, a lot of them are high school grads that can pass a, a written exam. They're going to spill something occasionally, and it's just it's, it's a big risk here. So I believe in the like you know what are you willing, what tolerances you allowed to have, what do you what do you like, what do you not like, and um, you know that's a that's a big play inside of this. So absolutely, man, we're already at forty nine minutes. I've asked you a lot of questions already. What should have I asked? Like, what should we be talking about to make the I most think, impact for the customers? I think we listeners? got it. I I think we did it. I, I I'm very happy with the things we talked about. Cool. So okay, let's just let's do this. Somebody wants to, they're new out there that they they're getting into this space. I am like, I'm not compensated in this point. I might talk to you later about affiliate program or something. But at this point, there's nothing, there's no agreement between me and you. You're on the show. I just love what you do and who you are as a person. How do people reach out to you and, 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 and look at some of the stuff you've got going on so they can learn this space? Cause you do sure. teach this. Yeah. So I, I have a podcast like you do. It's called business lunch and we talk about all kinds of stuff like this. And um, that's a great place to, you know, to connect, uh, you can go to, I have a challenge I do that's at get Epic challenge. It's a free challenge. Um, and so, you know, you go through there and basically we talk about kind of more in depth over five days. What are some of the strategies and things like that? And then I'm on social everywhere at forward slash Roland Frazier. So TikTok, YouTube, Instagram, there's tons of content I put out all the time on that stuff. That's awesome. And I tell you, uh, I've, I've, I'm about, a, I'm getting close to about a hundred interviews now. I've interviewed uh, pretty much anybody that's teaching this space. I've taken a couple of the courses for content. You provide the most content, you know, Thanks. I'm still watching some of the videos. There's, there's enough content there that I just go when I, when I'm missing something, I go, I bet Roland's got a, you know, a video on that inside of my, you know, my locker or whatever you want to call oh, that's it. That's great. Uh, is it a Kajabi board or whatever you guys are using? But there's yeah. something there on this. I just need to dig and find it. So I, you know, to this point, I have my library now. Uh, when I was in real estate, I had I bought a course from somebody that had like 35 different courses. It was like 40 or 50 grand. But uh, you know, it was called the whole enchilada is what he actually called it. It was everything you needed. Oh, that would so be I Ron had, Legrand. Uh, it was, uh, it was uh, Lou Brown, Ron Legrand's buddy. Oh, Lou. Okay. Lou's yeah. actually a, a customer of mine. I've got, I, he's in our mastermind. That's funny. In our deals mastermind. Yeah. He's a great guy. And yeah. ask him about me. I did, I did short sales. He asked me to help him rewrite it. Rewrite his short I sales. will. Right? I will. So he'll, he'll know who I am. But uh you know, I had that filing cabinet. If something was in real estate, I needed a contract or I needed to learn how to do something. Lou had the whole enchilada, so I could just pull it off there and go look at it. Or, or sometimes you know, we just call him, you know, hey, man, we got this problem. Yeah. You've, you've provided that resource. And, then, you know, it's, it's not in your free program. It's in the next level up. But that free program that you have is unbelievable value for the oh, amount thanks. of time. Um, I still, I'm still on your, uh, I'm on all the mailing list, of course, and I'm on the, uh, the, Alumni. Uh, the alumni thing. So yeah. I just got uh, an email the other day. They posted saying, here's the whole workbook in one, in one chunk. And I was like, ah, mine is no pieces. I grabbed that too. And uh, I'm right, that, every time it's funny is I go back through it occasionally because your, your things change things you want. Like what I thought I wanted when I first got into this space, um, which was almost two years ago, we did a marketing roll up, which took a lot of my time. And then now I'm back in, okay, what do I want to do next? It's going through those worksheets again is extremely valuable. Right. Yeah. And they change. I've, I update constantly and I put the new stuff in and, you know, like if you're in the alum Greg and I group, you know, you know, and I also add them to everybody that's, you know, that's got a part of the program, you know, so whenever we do new agreements, new contracts, new deals, that stuff goes in there. I think that's, that's just part of the giving back to the community because ultimately, you know, my goal is that there will be some people in there that bring deals that I want to do. And we end up doing them. It's happened several times that we do deals together. So it's a win-win for everybody. Just remind people how they reach out to you. And uh, let's just call it a show after that. Sure. So I'm pretty much everywhere online forward slash R O L A N D F R A S I E R Roland Frazier. Uh, you can find my challenge at get epic challenge.com podcast is business lunch and uh, love to connect with anybody. I answer all my uh, messages myself. 
I appreciate having you on here. I've been looking forward to this for a while, and we've been texting back and forth. And uh, I'll I'll publicly apologize for more ordering hot coffee from you that or hot cocoa from you the other night at eleven o'clock after our after you uh, uh, confirmed the show. I mixed you up with like my wife had been texting me and she rocked into the house and said, heat up some water. I'm gonna mix some hot cocoa. We're under the stars and stuff. And I looked down and I sent it to you. So I liked it. <laughs> hey, I'm, I'm always for hot cocoa. I didn't, <laughs> There's never a bad time. Yeah. Luckily I didn't tell you I was making it Irish, but that wouldn't probably bother you either. So <laughs> no, but, um, wouldn't. <laughs> I appreciate your time. Thank you for being here. And uh, thank you. The show. Cool. And is there anything I can do for you? You know, I, I just keep keep doing what you're doing, man. Keep putting out the content because when I come back, you know, there's 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 questions that I have, and I always know I can come back and jump in another epic challenge or another you know 100%. another call you have and and get that stuff done. And you've got a support system around you that's just unbelievable. A, a lot of a lot of people don't understand. A lot of the people that have been on this show are either coaches of yours or have been coaches of yours in the past. I've I've interviewed a lot of them already. So oh, nice. That's great. So, yeah. So it's been a very cool. Okay. Resource. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. Cool. Thank you. Thanks. Hey, it's your host, Ronald Skelton. I want to thank you personally for watching the show today and invite you to call our new hotline, 918-641-4150. That's 918-641-4150. Call us and tell us about our show, ask questions, uh, suggest a guest, or even tell me about a business you have for sale and we'll reach back out to you. Again, that number is 918-641-4150. Call our hotline leave us some information. Thank you. I want to announce our new channel partners, the ITX Marketplace. Since 1998, ITX has created $5 billion in value by selling more than 225 IT businesses in 20 countries. ITX works exclusively with IT-enabled businesses generating between $5 million and $30 million who are ready to be sold and m and to decision makers who are ready to buy. For over 25 years, ITX has developed industry knowledge that helps determine whether a seller is a good fit for their buyers before making the match. ITX Mergers and Acquisition Marketplace, we have partnered with, has a proprietary database of 50,000 plus global buyers seeking IT service firms, managed service providers, Microsoft service providers, software as a service platforms, and channel partners with Microsoft, Oracle, ServiceNow, and and, and the Salesforce space. If you have an IT-enabled business you're ready to sell, I want you to visit the IT exchangenet.com slash marketplace how to exit that link will be in the show notes visit them now the investors and entrepreneurs professional mastermind the investors and entrepreneurs professional mastermind combines the traditional peer-to-peer mastermind introduced first in napoleon hill's famous book think and grow rich with accountability partnering where your peers help you ensure that you set goals, take actions, and get results. If you want to scale, blow past roadblocks, and achieve success faster than you might think is possible, I suggest you take a visit over to TIEPM.com. That's T-I-E-P-M.com and check out the Investors and Entrepreneurs Professional Mastermind.